Wow. That's good. I tell you guys often, you know, to have a chance to hear the songs in two services, and it gets better and better every time. Thank you, Milt. Thank you, Stacy. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, so much. Thank you that you chose to be our friend and didn't walk away. 1 Corinthians chapter number 16. We made it. We've been singing about uh, chapter 15 quite a bit the last two or three weeks of the resurrection of Christ, what it's going to be like when we see Christ. We preached last week about our resurrection as believers in the Lord and how one day you and I will be in his presence in heaven. And so we're so thankful and wonderful, just wonderful music and already prayer and time in the, in the Lord. So we're going to get into the word here. Before I do that, I remind you that after second service today, and I, again, I don't do this often, I just want to highlight these two things today as I did last Sunday, VBSC. Our summer camp for children is here, and uh, not far away. It'll be the first full week of June, and so our involvement meeting is today. And make sure that you come. Make sure that, uh, and if you can't come, make sure you let Pam or, or Brian know that you're going to be involved. I sent an email to the church in the middle of this past week. Uh, go search it out. Go find it. Click the button if you're on the platform for our emails, and you'll be able to say, uh, engage the mission. I'd like to be part of it. I'd like to uh, sign up and I can do this or I could do that. But today for our info, uh, involvement meeting, there'll be some information that you'll get from Pastor Brian and from Pam. So uh, take the time, just a few minutes, just to be here. It won't be a long meeting. It'll be about 10, 15 minutes at the most. And uh, with many different things going on, I understand your time is valuable and they will not waste your time. It'll be well worth your time. Also, a week from this Sunday, Pastor Kevin Pesky will be preaching uh, the third message of our family conference on Sunday morning. So next Sunday, we'll be speaking about how to raise children, how to train up a child in the way you should go. Uh, and you say, well, I, I raised my kids, I don't have any children, or uh, you don't want to raise my kids, and there's nothing in the Bible that can help me raise my kids. Well, yes, there is, but you don't know my kids. Well, I may know you as a parent, so I can see genetics and had a way of playing into it. But no, as a church, you see, even if you don't have children, uh, you can be part of that on next Sunday morning and learn some things. Maybe one day you'll have children, or one day maybe you will not, but you can be part of ministry and caring for children. That happens so uh, when you're in ADP sports or something like that. It's very, very important to get a little bit more uh, Bible knowledge, understanding, and wisdom in that area. The Saturday night before next Sunday is a marriage evening for married couples. We welcome you. Please come and be part of that. We're going to have a dinner, full big meal, and uh, we've got uh, room for 60 couples. So make sure that you sign up. We've been sending out emails uh, if you have a question on how to do that, give us a call at the office uh, this week or give me a call directly, and we will line you up to be involved in uh, Saturday evening. Again, for married couples, it would be good to know that you are coming so we can plan the food properly. And then, of course, Friday night it kicks off. Friday night is everyone's involved. I mean, everyone is, uh, is invited. We'd love to have you come. You say, well... Uh, I'm already all set with the kid thing. I'm already set as a grandparent. I'm already set with my marriage. But Friday night is for everyone to welcome moms, dads, and young people as well. Most of all, how do I date well? How do I uh, seek the Lord and find out who it is that I'm supposed to be with in marriage? Or maybe, of course, and maybe you will never be married. I don't know if that's what God would have for your life. But you'd like to know how to have a better relationship with others. That's what Friday night's going to be like. So make sure that if you have a teenager or a young person and you say, hey, I, I don't know how to lead and direct my children on how to do those type of things, how to date someone, court someone to be married, come on in. 
and be part of it, maybe you need a little bit of wisdom from the Lord on how to give someone wisdom from the Word of God. Pastor Kevin will be, again, speaking Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday morning. Please take advantage of this opportunity. We're making a huge investment in this family conference on purpose for you because, again, it can make us better in the Lord, in Christ alone, coming off of our Acts 1-8 conference. As you're in 1 Corinthians chapter number 16, we finish up our study that we have called Love Never Fails. And of course, if you're reminded, back in chapter number 13, verse number 8, charity never faileth. But whether they be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether they be tongues, they shall cease. Whether they be knowledge, it shall vanish away. That's chapter number 13, verse 8. That is the theme verse behind love never fails. That has been our study since we uh, started up uh, uh, last summer sometime. I believe it was in June or July. And here we are at the end of it. The last couple of weeks, we've uh, actually from uh, Easter, Resurrection Sunday, and of course the two other Sundays after that, we have been able to look at chapter 15, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel, of course, of the Lord Jesus Christ, as it's spoken in the first four verses of chapter 15. I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, and Paul preaches it, speaks it, and of course reiterates it for the church at Corinth. And as we finished up, I said earlier last week, we spoke about our resurrection in Christ after the Sunday before, speaking of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's a heavy doctrinal book. In a lot of areas in the church of Corinth needed a little bit of help in their doctrine. They really needed some direction. There was false doctrine. There was sin in a lot of areas in the church. There was following man instead of following the Lord Jesus Christ. There was contradictions and conflicts over the spiritual gifts. So much going on in this church, and Paul covers so very much. And as I said in chapter number 15, you see, again, a very heavy doctrinal delivery by Paul. You see, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, reminding you and reminding us, bestows upon us a new life. It's the victorious Christian life. It is this victory in Jesus. Where does it come from? Verse number 57, chapter number 15. But thanks be to God, which give us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That resurrection is serious stuff. It's everything that we hang our faith in. And of course, remember what it said earlier in chapter 15. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. We are miserable because if he just died and was buried and never raised from the dead, then what does this all matter? But it matters because he did raise from the dead. The resurrection of Christ, it gives us everything in order for us to push forward. Our resurrection glory as it says on the screen, lays a heavy responsibility then upon us today to serve. I didn't spend a lot of time in finishing up in verse 58. Why? Because it's going to be our message introduction today. Think of what it says in this verse number 58. It is a compelling statement for every one of us. My beloved brethren, Paul says, therefore, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of of the Lord, abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. When we look at chapter 15 and everything that's there, and we have to see maybe some connectivity, maybe there's no connectivity. Well, I think there is. The connection between the two chapters is a common one in Scripture. We understand that oftentimes when Paul preached and spoke of heavy doctrinal things, and he gave a glimpse of the end times or of heaven, it is always for the purpose of living more faithfully here on earth. There's the connection piece. He's hitting heavy doctrines, speaking about the resurrection, the coming of Christ, everything. He says, okay, what am I doing here? What am I doing here? What are you doing here? Why did you get saved? 
again, why are you saved? Why am I saved? Why is it that you are sitting here today, Lord willing, you get up and you walk out the door, and you think, what does God want us to do with our new life in Christ? Every once in a while, you need to ask that of the Lord, like every morning. Why am I here? Why am I still here? Why does God keep on bothering me a little bit here and there? Or why does God continually reveal to me that there's more for my life than what I had yesterday because today I woke up and I'm in Christ. In fact, who am I here for? You ought to ask yourself that question. Because if we truly believe, we will pray. If we really believe, we will study and worship and obey and serve and we will give. It is a fact of life that we truly do something about what we believe in. We do. We act upon what we believe to be true or we perceive to be true. If you think that the greatest thing in life is to go just blow all your money every week after you make it, then that's what you're going to go do. Because you have a perception in your mind that that's the most important thing. That's what you act on because you think it's true. My happiness. That's the thing that really drives me. That's truth. Truth is me being happy. Well, you're going to act upon it. See, Paul's going to hit in chapter 16 some giving, some mission work, some servanthood, and at the end he's going to cover a little bit about relationships. And we have to look at ourselves and say, God, why am I here? Who am I here for? So let me just ask you a couple tough questions again. What stirs in our heart? What goes through our thought process, when there is a need presented before you. You open up the Bible, and you say, God, show me what you want me to grab today, but then is there a need? Is there something, something I'm supposed to do today? You came to church service today, and you may have a lot of different reasons, but I believe that one of the universal reasons is you want to hear from God. Right now, we're praying, dear God, Give this man the wisdom to get out of the way so that your word can be proclaimed in Jesus' name. Amen. That's what we want today. I want to hear God's word speak to me while I'm speaking to you. I mean that. When you did break time yesterday with some of the little kids, some of you little coaches. Or well, some of you co little coaches. Some of you coaches with the little kids. And you want them to hear. And we're doing a little break time theme. Teach us to pray. What better thing can you get with children than to, hey, do you like praying? Do you like to teach kids? To, would you like to learn how to pray? Let's do what Jesus taught his disciples. Let's give him honor and glory and call him who he is. And let's ask him to do his will. Let's pray according to his will. That's our first two lessons so far. Is that really complicated? No, because Jesus taught it to the disciples. So now you in that position are going to go, okay, maybe, just maybe, something will stir in that child's heart. Something will go on and they'll say, hey, I need more of that. Or maybe some will come out in prayer and you go, wow, there's a need here. <laughs> what do we do with what God puts before us? Just stop and think for a minute. Let me ask you another thing. What comes to mind when opportunities for us to be always abounding in the work of the Lord, verse 58, are revealed and God is speaking to us? I mean, I asked you a minute ago, what stirs in our heart and goes through our thought process when there is a need presented? Now, what comes to mind when opportunities for us to be not just, okay, well, that one sounds good, let me do that. And that one sounds good, and let me do that. But what goes on? What happens in your mind when God says, I want you to be always abounding in the work of the Lord? And that's revealed to you, and God speaks to you and speaks to me and goes, Hey, I want you to abound. The word abound means to have an overflow. 
The word abound means to exceed a fixed number of measure. Is anything in your life in regards to the Lord Jesus Christ abounding? That's what Paul's asking the church of Corinth to consider. That you would be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's a great introduction to chapter number 16. See, servanthood is just not a one-off thing. In fact, we'll get into it at the end here, it's an addiction. For some, it says that Stephanus was addicted to the work of the Lord. Some of you are addicted to some bad stuff. Do you know how easy it is to get addicted to anything? Anything. How is it that we restrict getting addicted to always abounding in the Lord? I guess we have to work really hard on that, don't we? We somehow fall into a place of being addicted to the wrong things and we can't get out of them but we won't fall into being addicted to the work of the Lord. There is opportunity everywhere Paul is showing them to be addicted to the Lord. In fact, the simple title of our message today, Opportunity Abounds. It does. Opportunity overflows in God's kingdom work. Just simply put, Seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added. There is in his kingdom work so much to be done in the body of Christ. There is so much to be done. There's so much work of the Lord to be done, everybody. And I don't speak about this very often. I just, whatever the word of God comes with today, these 24 verses are serious about coming off of verse number 58. Will we look at it and say, Paul says, therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You are not wasting your time, and it is not a fool's errand when you are serving the Lord. It has never been, he says, something of vanity. And that's why he puts before you and me opportunity well, I don't like all those opportunities that this local ecclesia has. That's cool. But pray about it and maybe, just maybe, God will compel you to say, Hey, pastor, is there any place that there is a need so that I can abound in the work of the Lord here at the church that God's put me at? You may not even know that there is a, splot, a spot and a slot right there waiting for you. The opportunity abounds. Let's look in our scripture. Let's go through four simple lesson points today. We're going to start out, of course, with verse number one. We'll take the first four verses, and let me go after this with four simple pieces and parts. Join with me in verse number one. I will read. It'll be up on the screen as always. You can follow along in your Bible or on the screen. Now, concerning the collection for the saints... So this is the what, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. How are we going to do it? Verse 2, upon the first day of the week, when, first day of the week, when, let every one of you lay by him in store, where is the store here, just like a farmer's bin or a farmer's a farmhouse or a barn, this is what God is using through his word to establish the when and the where. As God has prospered him, how much, that there be no gatherings when I come. And when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, then will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. I will take what you're giving me and I will go back to Jerusalem because there's some people hurting and this is a missions offering. This is an extra offering for the people that are in poverty back there. They're impoverished and they need some help. Verse 4. And if it be meet that I go also, they shall go with me. If, if it meets there and I have to, if that's part of it, then I'll go. I'll go myself. How does this start out? Well, here's your first one. Opportunity abounds in the work of the Lord 
to give by grace to affect the eternal more than the temporal. To affect the eternal more than the temporal. What's he saying very simply here? We are going to talk about giving. For a moment we are. Here's full verses, very simply put. The offering or the giving that he's asking about and telling them that they need to be part of is, hey, do you know that there's a special need here? There's a missionary coming through. There's a church hurting. Maybe even your old pastor. Right? There's a need. There's something there. Well, what can we do to raise some monies to give them a meal? That's what this is. It's above the operational costs of everybody giving a tithe and the, the giving to make sure that the church is running. But that extra offering he's speaking of would be, hey, there's a missionary that needs $10,000 in Zambia, Africa in order to feed children. Does that sound familiar? Well, that's over and above. That's a, hey, let's present that to some people and have them pray. And he needed a couple dollars and he got a couple more than a couple dollars. But that was for the collection. It was however God prospered. It says up there, giving heart. When I was a lost guy, I had a really big giving heart. And you don't know what my favorite foundation was to give to? The Mark Brown Foundation. Brownie's bullpen. I'm going to give to myself. Is there anything wrong with giving to myself? I didn't think there was. After being saved, God took that giving heart that he was already kind of working on. I learned it from my mom. Do things for people a little bit. But now it was for Jesus Christ. It wasn't an act or a work where, well, go do something for somebody and you'll get yourself closer to heaven. That was the religion that I lived in. I was taught that if I did enough good works and they outweighed the bad ones, I'd have a better chance of going to heaven. So giving things to people, that's a good one, right? You see, Paul was laying something out and saying, hey, church, if you're going to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, and know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, and here's a spot. <coughs> Paul says there is a need. It's back at Jerusalem. Whatever you give. This is what happens to you and me. In the principles of giving is that we find out when to do it how to do it and all that and we get that but really what comes out here is the perspective what is it that I am looking at and how am I looking at this giving God changes my perspective he says hey there's missionary offerings, there's special need offerings, there's different kinds of offerings. Remember back in Acts chapter number 2, verse number 44 and 45, they didn't even have a church uh, uh, manual on how to do everything they were supposed to do. They just knew in Acts 2 that all that believed were together, had all things common, sold their possessions and good, and parted them to all men as every man had need. That was Acts 2. Acts 4, verse 34, neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of land, as they were prospered, and houses sold them, and brought the prices of things that were sold, and they took care of one another. What a great principle. And that's what Paul is doing here. He can change your heart in so many ways, and one of the first ones out is to say, Giving by grace, to give by grace can affect the eternal more than the temporal. But you and I, by the way, how much is one of those energy drinks now, like a can? How much is that? What? 250 That's cheap. That's cheap. Cup of coffee is $3.30 at stinking scooters. What are they doing here? They're ruining everything. That's just the coffee. Never mind the foo foo drink. And it's fine, you know, you've been prospered. Go for it. But here's the point 
opportunity abounds in the work of the Lord. To give by grace. To affect the eternal. I came to you all last October and told you that, hey, a special offering off of our Acts 1-8 conference, we wanted to be in a place where we could do something for the pastors and make sure that we kept them all on staff together. So, so many of you gave to that, and I'm thankful. The year before, I said we'd love to just do a little cleaning up here and uh, do some painting and, and uh, do a little something we hadn't done. We'd done some things and in the 20 years of the building and you gave to that and that was over and above when we said hey when Alex Chippy was here Pastor Alex and his wife and children they only had two then back in 2020 we said we want to do something for Kafula Futa mission station because Pastor Brian and Tammy their offerings that they received that they took to make sure that that mission station worked that wasn't going to be there what can we do and you gave twenty three thousand eight hundred dollars to that that was above that was that was this why am i spending a little time on it just to encourage you that you look around and you say i wonder well we got a church of like three thousand people did you know that no <laughs> we have a church of a few hundred people that say hey if the Holy Spirit of God, if God's word is leading the pastor and he puts something before us, let's, let's do something with it. And I thank you and thank you and thank you. That's a giving heart. And First Bible Baptist Church has a generous heart. And it's wonderful for us to learn that together. Let's go to our second lesson point. Because Paul goes into something about the seeking heart in chapter Number 16, verses 5 through 12. Let's read these verses. Verse 5. Now Paul says, I will come to you, unto you, when I pass, shall pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia. Remember, he's writing from Ephesus. He was at Corinth. He went there to start another church in Ephesus. Now he hears, and he writes this word back, this letter. And so he's saying, hey, let me tell you my plans on the mission journey. I'm on a mission's journey. Verse 6, and it may be that I will abide, yea, in winter with you, that ye may bring me on my journey whithersoever I go. For I will not see you now, by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you, if the Lord permit. I'm setting out my journey, but I'm being flexible, I'm looking at it, because verse 8 says, but I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost, so that tells you he's not taken off quickly. Good? We know where we're at, right? Okay, verse number 9. For a great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. I believe I'm headed in the right direction. The door is open, but he sees the attack of the enemy, and there are adversaries against what his mission work is. Verse 10. Now if Timotheus come, see that he may be with you without fear. Comfort him, take care of him, for he worketh the work of the Lord as I also do. Let no man therefore despise him, but conduct him forth in peace, that he may come unto me, for I look for him with the brethren. Remember Timotheus? You know Timothy? He is his son in the Lord. He has discipled him, mentored him, and he is pastoring, going to take over the work of Ephesus. But if he comes, take care of him. Simple. This is the mission journey that is laid out and how God is directing Paul to this church at Corinth. And he's saying, I want to let you know that I'm leaning on God's will more than anything else. Verse number 12. As touching our brother Apollos, I greatly desired him to come unto you with the brethren, but his will was not at all to come at this time, but he will come when he shall have convenient time. So that's a really neat layout of the mission that he is on. Up at the screen it says very simply this. Opportunity abounds in the work of the Lord to seek his will. Seek his will above all to affect the mission. You know what it means to affect? I used the word earlier. I'm going to use it throughout my four lesson points. It's an action word. It's a simple action word. But it directs. It emphasizes 
that when you affect something, you make a difference. Something changes when you make an effect. Affect, affect is the verb. To affect something. What is the effect of the effect? Did I do that all right, Debbie Summers? And a girl. I learned from you. You just didn't know I was paying attention. You learned from me. Yeah, there you go. Now see, listen. Oftentimes, we make out our own mission journey. We kind of put things together in a certain way. Say, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to do. I mean, I consulted God about it, but I heard that this would be the way to go. Now, Paul is saying to the church at Corinth, a great model to follow. He says, I have a vision. I see the vision. I'm flexible to it. I know that there's some things that may go wrong or go right. I don't know. I, I'm capturing what you'd have me to do. But I'm saying in verse number 7 and 8, I'm going to stay at Ephesus and take care of the work that I'm already called to. Please do not think that, hey, I got these brilliant ideas and I'm just going to throw away this ministry to go to the next ministry. He's saying, look, I'm on a mission. The mission work that God's got me to. And I know where he's got me going, but I'm flexible. I have a vision from God. But I know that I have to finish the work that I'm already called to. You need to have a seeking heart. I need to have a seeking heart. We need to have a seeking heart for the Lord's will. Do we really do things according to God's will? I believe God has honored this church in many ways through many of you that have confirmed his will in our lives through your time in the word of God. Through the Holy Spirit making it clear. I've learned a principle many, many years ago in pastoring that we all must seek the Lord and seek the Word of God and seek the will of God because we want differences. I mean, for, for people to make a difference in the name of Jesus Christ according to His Word for not just a moment. So many churches, so many believers do the will of God for a moment. Wow, wasn't that awesome? Wasn't I great? Didn't God bless me? And it's just a fleeting moment. It's a flash in the pan moment. Thus what it says up there. Paul was never any flash in the moment apostle. He was no... Gosh, that guy just had a moment of brilliance. Wow, wasn't he just great? I know we have all the different sports analogies. But really where it goes back to is John 6 when Jesus says that he's there to do the Father's will. And he conveys that to them. He says, I'm here to do my Father's will. I'm here. In fact, John 6, 638. I'll read it real quick so that I don't misrepresent the scripture. It says, For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. That's Jesus speaking. Paul is saying the same thing. And you and I have to have a seeking heart of God's will, or else we'll be in a place where we do moment by moment, this was great. Well, yeah, when you tie moments together, if it's God's will over it all, then it's more of a course that you're on. And God is revealing his vision that he's already given to you is actually true. And you have this incredible courage in verse number 9. When it says there's adversaries, you pick up this courage from the Lord to be able to handle it. And you see that he mentions Timotheus, his partner in ministry, and how he has this heart to work together with him between Timothy and Apollos and all that they do to follow after God's Direction in God's will. Opportunity abounds in the work of the Lord to seek his will above everything in order to affect the mission more than a moment. Third one, verse number 18, excuse me, uh, verse number 13 through 18. Follow along with me up on the screen or on your Bibles. Watch ye. Verse number 13, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. Boy, those are some good commands. Verse number 14, let all things be done with charity. You could preach an hour-long message on that. Verse 15, 
I believe they tie together well, 15 through 18, with this statement that Paul is making. I beseech you, brethren, ye know the house of Stephanus, that is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints, that ye submit yourselves unto such, and to everyone that helpeth with us and laboreth. I am glad of the coming of Stephanus and Fortunus and Achaicus, for that which was lacking on your part, they supplied. There's that teamwork principle in this, verse 18. How did it come about, and what was the result? For they refresh my spirit and yours. Therefore, acknowledge ye them that are such. Acknowledge them that they have done the work that goes back to verse number 13 and 14 of standing fast, letting things be done with charity, which goes back to verse number 58 of chapter 15 of being steadfast and unmovable. You see, Paul is doing such a practically strong teaching, practical teaching here in 16, off of all that doctrine. So what's our third lesson point? Opportunity abounds in the work of the Lord to serve people, to affect them. Remember, make a difference in them, to affect them for tomorrow even more than today. Some people, again, are really good at serving, and they do such a wonderful job with a serving heart. But serve, we serve deeply, like we are addicted, like Stephanus, to affect them for tomorrow, even more than today. Consider this. I use this terminology a great deal in ADP sports. Repetition. Repetition. We've got a few goal, uh, a few skills to work on some things. We have some goals that we want to accomplish. Repetition. 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 Add some little bit of spice to it. Change it up a little bit. Repetition. A kid learns how to dribble by dribbling more. They learn how to shoot by shooting more. Repeat. Repetitiveness. It's a great teaching tool. I heard that the Word of God does it quite a bit. We then use the word frequency. Repetition is within the session of two hours, whatever it may be in the sport, for the child. And then there's frequency, which is week by week by week by week. We do it every week. So within that framework, we have repetition. Within the framework of the league of six weeks, we have frequency. Every week we do it. Every week we do it. And then lastly, experience. A child, if their parent signs them up for one sport, two sports, three sports, then there's an opportunity to serve in a deep way that affects them for tomorrow even more than today. Children's ministry right now, repetition, talking about Jesus, the Word of God, speaking of doctrine, proper theology, over here with the little ones over here, over in young families, over in the youth group right now. It's constantly a part of repetition in the message, rep, uh, excuse me, frequency on the weekly basis, and over the course of a year, maybe, just maybe, what about discipleship, one by one, getting together and learning the scripture, memorizing scripture, frequency, I'm going to do it every week, back to the idea that we're going to repeat my point. When you are a servant and you have a servant's heart and you have a serving heart, you're willing to do all that it takes for someone to be in a place where they are in verse number 17. When Paul says, I mean verse number 18, for they have refreshed my spirit and yours. Why? Because they were addicted. They addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Obsessively surrendered to something. Wow. Wow. Obsessively surrendered to something. Are we addicted? Like Stephanus. The house of Stephanus. First fruits of the church plant in Achaia. And they addicted themselves to the ministry. 
of the saints. They ministered to the brothers and sisters of the church body. We are to watch out, look out for what the devil may do in the world and my flesh. Quit, le- quit ye like men. Come on now, grow up like a man. Do things the way you ought to. Be strong, be strong, and let all things be done with charity as you stand fast in the Lord. Opportunity abounds in the work of the Lord to serve people deeply, to affect them for tomorrow and not just for today. That would take for you and me a huge commitment. And lastly, the last few verses, pick it up in verse number 19 of chapter number 16 as we finish out our study. This is, this is a beautiful, easy place to finish. Because it speaks of Paul's loving heart and the fact that those that don't love Jesus. Verse 19, it says, The churches of Asia salute you. What does it mean when someone salutes you? They welcome you, they embrace you, they go to you, and they want to draw you to them. He's saying it in words, so he's saying, The churches of Asia salute you, Aquila and Priscilla. Priscilla, salute you much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. Where are they right now? He's writing from Ephesus, writing back to Corinth, where Aquila and Priscilla were at the church plant. You see, there's relationship, and they salute, and they greet you, and they mean it. And by the way, you pick it up in Romans, and you see that they're there as well. Aquila and Priscilla are pretty special. They gave her life. It might be said that they were addicted As it says in verse number 20, all the brethren greet you. Greet ye one another with a holy kiss, a a greeting. It doesn't have to be that way. It's a style of greeting, but it's saying, I greet you. Verse number 21, the salutation of me, Paul, with mine own hand. I salute you with my own hand, my letter. Paul goes to all the lengths possible to let them know how much he loves them. Verse number 22 on the other side of not loving the Lord. If any man love not the Lord, Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. Maranatha. Anathema simply means cursed, to be cursed. Maranatha means Lord come, or when the Lord comes. Simply put in that simple two-word statement, that person that does not love the Lord Jesus Christ is cursed when the Lord comes. But on the other side of love, he says in verse number 23 and 4, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you all. In Christ Jesus, amen. He knows that God's love never fails, that we're to do all things with charity. He is saying very simply that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Opportunity abounds in the work of the Lord to others in Christ Jesus. Listen, opportunity abounds in the work of the Lord to love others in Christ, to affect their life more than their countenance. What are you saying there, Pastor? Sometimes you can just make somebody smile. And some of you are really good at that. You change the countenance of a person just by your love for the Lord when you walk in to a room. And that's good. But more than that, you can affect or make a difference in their life with the love of Christ that's in you. Why did the Lord save your soul? Who are you here for? Paul is saying to this church, we greet you, we salute you, we wish you could, we could be there with you. My salutation comes out of the letter that I've written. You wrote to me and you had some difficulties. I responded to those and then all the others as the Holy Spirit led me to put it into the Word of God. So here's the first letter to the church at Corinth. They still had some struggles, so he wrote a second letter to them. 
He went to visit with them and he was there for 18 months. He went there again and he was with them some more time. And it says that he desired to go to see them a third time. Paul loved them so much. And he didn't just change their countenance, which I bet their countenance changed when they read this letter in real time in 58 AD. But I will say this. That affectionate, goodwill, benevolence type of love, that agape type of love that comes from charity was because this man had such a deep, loving heart for the people of God. He also had a deep, loving heart for the lost that were going to hell. But he said, look, those that don't love the Lord Jesus Christ, they're cursed. That's true today, too. When the Lord comes, they're cursed as they never called in the name of the Lord to save I don't know if that's maybe one of you today or some of you. I don't know. But the Bible says you'll be accursed. I know I was before July of 1983 when I called out to the Lord. The scriptures, they really got a hold of me. God convicted me through his scriptures. And I realized all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I realized I was cursed and accursed. And if God took my life in a moment before that day that I called out to him, then I would have spent eternity in hell when I, when I died. For you believers right now, and you're thinking, do I have a giving heart? Praise the Lord. Do I have a, lo- a heart that seeks the Lord and seeks his will? Praise the Lord. If there's a place where I have a serving heart and I love serving, and it's not just for the moment or it's just not for a minute, but it's for my life, and you have a loving heart today, then maybe you know why Jesus Christ saved your soul. So for our invitation today, it says something very simple up on the screen. Why did Jesus save my soul? I've mentioned it three times. If you're saved today, you're born again. Why did he save you? And who are you here for? Who am I supposed to affect? Maybe, just maybe, the Holy Spirit has talked to you through the Word of God. Maybe the Word of God has come off the pages and spoken to you today and gone, I know why Jesus saved my soul, first of all, for his glory, for his honor. For the joy that was set before him, he went to the cross. He obeyed the Father's will. But on the other side, there's a purpose for my life. I'm to edify people in the name of Jesus. I'm to serve. I'm to seek God's will. I'm to love because he loved me first. Why don't we bow for a word of prayer and enter into our time of prayer together. Our Father in heaven, as we come to this most important time, all of this has been important. For a few minutes, I pray that you will just work in our lives by your word, by the Lord Jesus Christ and his holy and perfect name, by the power of the Holy Spirit that reproves and brings conviction. I pray for this prayer time that it honors you, gives you glory, and edifies the members of this body, First Bible Baptist Church. We need you. We're so needy. And I pray at the end of, or on the other side of that question that's on the screen, that each person, each brother and sister would say, Lord, I need your purpose in my life. Please show me who I'm to affect in Jesus' name. Please stand.